I want you to imagine uh, you're staying in a very nice hotel and uh, on the desk there is a basket of fruit uh, just as you're checking in. So you can have an apple or an orange or a banana. And it's a nice touch for that particular hotel. Sometimes they have a, uh, a bowl of uh, sweets that you can have. So I want you to imagine now it's, it's about four months later and you're driving in the countryside and it's dark and it's wet and it's cold and you arrive late at this hotel that's many, many kilometers or many miles from any other hotel. And you walk in the door and you get hit by this extraordinarily bad smell. In fact, it's one of the worst smells you've smelt in, in, in many years. And somehow you struggle up to the desk and the girl behind the desk is wearing a gas mask. Right. So you put your elbows down on the desk because you're beginning to get a little bit dizzy. Um, and the smell is getting worse and worse. And slowly, your eyes are dragged to the bottom of the desk where there is this big bowl of rotting, stinking fruit. And it looks like that bowl has been left on the desk for, for months. So you're beginning uh, to faint. And also, you're about to vomit. You're multitasking. Um, so. As, as you're multitasking and you're falling backwards and you're in this faint, you're, you're thinking to yourself, why on earth did they leave a bowl of fruit on the desk there? They must have left it there for months. But just before you hit the ground, just that moment before you hit the ground, you think about your website. <laughs> Imagine if there was such a thing as smelly content. Yeah. Do you think there'd be less content if content went off? Right? Now, content may not smell, but it sure does stink. Right? Oh, what's, <laughs> what is a reminder coming up? OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, <laughs> I grew up in a small farm in Ireland, uh, and we didn't even have a tractor. And we were, we were very miserable. But, but of course, the Irish are inherently miserable. Uh, we love, with, now that we're in a recession again, we're really happy. Uh, there was a very famous Irishman, Samuel Beckett, once said, he said, I can't go on. I won't go on. I'll go on. Right? So when I was growing up, we were, we were poor. And uh, we, had, we actually had an ass and cart. And sometimes I was thinking, if the web looked like an ass and cart, would it look like that? Or would it look like that? <laughs> yeah. And the question really is, who, who are we in the process? You know, are we this guy here? Are, do we feel like the poor ass uh, now and then? Or do you see you know, that, that arm just leaving the picture saying, it's not my ass. I've got nothing <laughs> to do with that. A lot of the world that we live in today, we have this incredible capacity to produce and add to it. And as somebody say, said to me there a couple of months ago, they said, the web, you know, it never poops. You know, it's just eating and eating and eating, adding and adding and adding. It is this weird digestive system, constantly adding to the environment, but never removing from it. Because we think, or we've been told because of theories like the long tail, that the magical search engine will figure it all out. Right? And that is a lot the problem that partly when we come from the other world, we come from the world of print. When we created things in print, there was this inherent redundancy built into print. Because the book disappeared, the article disappeared, the page, the brochure inherently disappeared. It ended up sooner or later in the bin or out of print. Right. But nothing ever goes out of print in the digital world. Right. It always remains in the environment unless you make a specific action to remove it. But most companies that I work with in this area, and I've been doing this since 1994, they have a fabulous capacity to create and publish, but they have inherently zero capacity to actually review and remove and actually take away from the environment. This is the BP web team after the Isle Slick, because 
they were getting paid based bonuses based on the amount of visitors. Right? And it's part of the cult of volume. They're saying, oh, we're so popular. Right? And this is the Toyota web team after the recall. They were absolutely de delighted. Another example of the cult of volume. And this was the Microsoft Vista web team. Because they said, they love us. Look at all these millions of people coming to our pages. Isn't it great? In a huge number of circumstances, having people coming to your website is a sign of a problem with your organization, rather than they're there because they love you. They're often there because they hate you. Right? You know, so, but we have inherently a lot of metrics which measure inputs and volumes and, you know, you know, hits. It all began with hits many years ago. Do you know what hit stands for? How idiots track success. Right? And the reason we chose hits was because many, many years ago, back in 96, 97, we had to prove that the web was important. And a senior manager was giving a talk uh, about the website, and we said, we, we need to say something important. So we looked through the web trends logs, and we said, where's the biggest number? Oh, there it is. Right, we have 10 gazillion hits, which are totally meaningless. But even today, we still measure based on volumes page views or, or traffic, you know, isn't it interesting? User experience, users, I, I, I often thought about that, the connection between, you know, uh, drugs and the web and this whole, whole, whole area, because we've got users, we've got traffic, and we've got hits, right? I want to tell you a story about a website. Once upon a time, there was a website, and a very good website it was. And it had a goal, give the customers what they want, help them find their need, you know, have, have a great experience for our customers. So the web team says, how do we translate that into something that, that is actually meaningful on a day-to-day -day basis? And the reality was, let's publish loads of cool content. Right? So they started publishing, and happy they were, working away diligently, adding pages and adding pages and adding pages to the website. And times were good, and people were happy. Right. Right. And traffic was increasing. But the manager said, we can do better. We can get more traffic. Right. We need more hits. Right, so they worked harder, and they added more pages, and more pages, and more stuff, and more features, and more tools, and everything. They, they thought everything was great, except that customer satisfaction, which in the early days had started to rise, now had reached a plateau and wasn't rising anymore. And they were puzzled, and they didn't know what was wrong. So they decided they'd try and fix things. So they looked at their content, and they said, hey, if it's broken, we'll repair it, we'll rewrite it. So they rewrote loads of their content, right? They were working hard, they were a really good web team. And they said, search, we need to get found. So they added keywords everywhere, right? They added keywords, every page. You know, half of search management is figuring out what you don't want to get found. Half of search management is figuring out what you don't want to get found. But they wanted everything to get found. So they added description and loads of really SOA on ACID, right? And they also, this was the navigation of their website. This is what most websites actually look to most people, right? right. Get this now. Did you know? You might like this. No, really. See this. And they saw, oh, then we've got a little extra space. Get this now. No, I think this is it. Oh, no, here. Here. There's a little more space down here. Let's fill it. Right? So they were working really hard. And you know what happened? The customer got more pissed off. Right. The harder they worked, the, the worse the reactions were coming back to their website. It was not good, right? It was not good. This is the story of Microsoft Excel. <laughs> Do you know Microsoft has about 15 million pages on its public website, 4 million of which have never been accessed? That is practically the population of Ireland of pages that nobody has ever looked at. <laughs>
So Microsoft, and I do a lot, a lot of work with Microsoft. Microsoft historically, <laughs> but maybe not anymore. <laughs> They've historically had a culture which many large, uh, large organizations have. You pay your technical writers or your writers based on what they produce. If you come to a manager in most large organizations and the manager asks you, well, what did you do last week? I took down 200 documents. You did what? You know, what did you actually produce? Right? The cult of production, the cult of volume is killing many of the experiences in our digital space. Right? So they had gone to the ultimate extreme and frustration in Microsoft Excel. And they decided they'd try a different approach, which is uh, an approach which I had been developing in Microsoft called a top task. Right? There, there are lots of experiences, but there's still a whole huge world out there that still is tasks. And I suppose we, they can both work together. Right? So they began to focus on the most important reasons that people were coming to Microsoft Excel, rather than trying to produce everything on every possible query or every possible thing that people were trying to do. Because the tiny tasks were killing them. Right? The tiny tasks explode in their thousands and in their millions. And you know, they're, they're small. In any environment, there is a book of flight. There is a book of room. And then there are hundreds and sometimes thousands of small, tiny tasks. And you know what? is about a tiny task. When a tiny task goes to bed at night, it dreams of being a top task. <laughs> and when it wakes up in the morning, it says, I'm going to be a top task. And it goes to the web team and says, I'm really important. You know, and it wants to get up the architecture. But we have to have a way of saying, away from me, tiny task. Back down the architecture. Right, without being nibbled to death by the tiny tasks. Most web teams I deal with are, are teams developing apps or whatever. A lot of their time is taken up responding to requests from the tiny tasks. Right, so how do we deal with the tiny tasks? Right. Many people uh, were coming looking for training in how to do pivot tables in Excel. Right. But there is also something called Excel services which is 1,000 less popular than Excel. And interestingly enough, loads of people were signing up for training for pivot tables in Excel services. And they were all saying, this training sucks. Because they weren't signing up. They were hoping to sign up for training in pivot tables for Excel, but they were getting training for pivot tables in Excel services. Tiny tasks and top tasks have word overlap invariably. There's only so many words in our language. So those words begin to repeat themselves, either in the navigation or either in the search results. And because people read so quickly, they say, oh, pivot tables, right? Uh, Excel, that must be the training, right? So they, they began to remove links from their website, right? They began to take links away, right? So, Page views dropped by 77%. But dissatisfaction dropped by 15%. Right? It's not enough to measure how many people came here. Right? We must also measure what did they do or not do when they arrived here. And a lot of the times we measure the inputs of the environment, but we are not measuring the outcomes. I think today we have the tools to measure outcomes of the environment like we never had before. And we really should measure the outcome, not the input of the environment. Did they sign up for the right training? Right. Rather than, hey, they love training on Excel services because loads of people are visiting them. It may be accidental. Right. A lot of visits to a lot of pages are accidental. So. Function pages were extremely popular. People would be finding sum, add a number. But what they really wanted to do was just sum a number, add a number. But they were finding the mathematical formula in some, in some function, because sum overlapping with sum or add. And there was the areas function, and there was the print function. So the function people were saying, hey, they love us. 
They, all these mathematicians out there, we didn't know there was 10 million of them. Right? So what did they have to do? What did they have to do? They'd, ultimately, they deleted all their function pages, and they put them into a single page called maths functions, so that these pages would be much less likely then to be found if somebody searched for sum or print area or whatever. So half of you know, good search management is figuring out the pages and the stuff you don't want to get found for a search as much as what you want to get found within the environment. And the result within six months was there, they had a high, they had a 10% high negative dissatisfaction, right? And it dropped to 3%. And their average SAT figures rose by 10 percentage points, and they had not budged in the previous four years. And they did that by essentially removing half their content, right? Delinking, cleaning up, and focusing on the core, the top tasks, the dominant reasons why people were coming to the website. This is a great Norwegian company uh, called NetLife Research. It says, we cut content, right? 90% of your uh, content on your website can be removed. Contact us today. Isn't that a great business to be in? <laughs> Isn't that a great business? We don't produce content. We remove it. And we, we charge you for it. Uh, yeah. We don't have any writers. We, we have snippers uh, in, in the process. They did it with Telenor. Right, they did it with Telnor. They deleted 87% of Telnor Nor Norway's uh, pages. Right? They deleted 87% of their pages, and conversion went up by 100%. Right? They deleted 87% of their pages, and conversion went up by 100%. Why? Because the tiny tasks, getting in the way of the top tasks. The, this low-level content, which proliferates and grows like weed on the web, getting in the way of the dominant reasons why people are at the website. Simplicity is a choice. Right? There is no, the, simplicity means making something else complex. Right? Because we live in a complex world. So if you have two options, and you want to make one of them really simple, you have to take one away. That's why most environments are not simple, because it's really hard to take away. It takes real skill to remove. Right? And we need to figure out what we need to remove in the process. So this is simplicity. This is complexity. Right? So what are you going to make simple? Because if you make one thing simple, you're probably making 10 other things more complicated. And you need to know what to make simple, because we can't make everything simple. And ease of use is a tsunami ripping across the world today. Five, 10 years, that demand was not nearly as great. I do a lot of work also for IBM. IBM find that their customers, which weren't asking for these things five years ago, are now demanding ease of use complex software environments that people would go. Somebody rang me up on the phone there a couple of months ago, and they said, oh, we need to do something. You know, we, we bring out new versions of our software every year or so. And the people, they used to accept to go on two-day training courses to learn the new version. He says, they won't do it anymore. You know, these, these bloody customers, they're getting very uppity. <laughs> you know, they won't go on two-day training courses anymore. They expect to be able to use it straight away. What a, an incredible concept. Right? <laughs> so this is complexity, right? This is Google. And also, you know, thinking of search engine optimization for a moment, I saw a great page of Google that says, if Google wanted to get found in Google, what would it look like? It would say, welcome to our search engine. We do search. We're a great search engine. Click here to search. Have you thought about searching for other things? Here's our top searches. Here's the most popular. If the Google wanted to get found in Google, it would look absolutely horrible. Right? The best way to optimize for search is to do something useful. Right? Do something that is easy and that is useful. This is Google if it was designed by most organizations. Hey, meet the Google guys. Sergey and Brin. And of course, you'd have, uh, you'd have Google News, Google Primes, Google Launches, Google Let's Google. They're working so hard. All those things they're doing for us. Somebody send them a Kit Kat and say, have a break. We don't deserve that. No, we don't. And then they say, new improved search. 
We are delighted. You, aren't you delighted when you read these? Where these I'm delighted to, to tell you. I don't give a crap what mood you're in. I don't care whether your cat has died, whether you're in Prozac. Who cares if Google is delighted? And then they say, it's now even easier to search on our website. If you ever have to say that, it's not. Because if it was easy, you'd just do it. Right? When we talk about easiness, well, it's not. Right? You just do it. Right? And then we have welcome to our website. And we have a complex search, because we're the PhDs of search. And the big banner ad. Right? Yeah. Look at all the money they are losing by not monetizing their homepage. They are crazy. Somebody should tell them this great idea. And somebody might finally say, how about putting a basic search box? So I think a lot of our job is about keeping the crap off. Right? Keeping the tiny tasks, whether they are the press releases or the, the, well, marketing might not want to be seen as a tiny task. But in a lot of people's experiences, the last thing they want on a website is marketing. Right? This was Yahoo in 2004. There were 255 links. Right. The classic long, we'll do everything. We'll have a link for everything. 255 links on the Yahoo homepage. And they realized that they had totally gone overboard. Right. So by 2006, they were down to 168, which was a 53% reduction. 2007, 239, another 17% reduction. 2008. 119, and they're now down roughly to about 90, 100 uh, links on their home page. Right? But they're a classic example, as against Google, of focus. Google has managed to maintain focus. Maybe they won't continue to ma maintain that focus over time, whereas Yahoo trying to be everything to everybody right? and not doing very well at it. Right? The tiny tasks again and the challenges of them. This is Liverpool, uh, Liverpool City. And it's a nice website now. You can, you can do stuff. A great web environment you can do straight away. You can, you can report something. You can do something. Right? We did a top task analysis with them. And we found six tasks. Right? So this is 100% of the vote. So yellow is the first 25%. So that was six tasks. The next 25% of the vote is 11 tasks. So these were customers voting on what were their top tasks, right? Their net 50 to 75% were 18 tasks. And the final 25% went to 49 tasks. So six tasks were getting as much of the vote as the bottom 49. And this pattern, we have done this about 400 times for Liverpool, for the BBC, for IKEA, Tetra Pak, Rolls Royce, Schlumberger, um, VMware, Cisco, Microsoft, IBM, the same patterns emerge all over the world, wherever, wherever we do. The, a relatively small set of tasks get a huge demand from the customers. And focusing on those and continuously improving on those is an important model of management. So this is the long neck, this is the long tail. What Liverpool did is they did a bit of research. And what they found, this is a map of their most active content contributors and what content these content contributors were actually producing. So we see this is the long neck here of the tasks and the demand. Right? So basically, what was happening here is the more important the task was, the less time and content was being created for it. So this, these were the top tasks. And this here was what the 50 most active contributors were actually doing. So there was an inverse relationship. The less important it was to the customer, the more stuff Liverpool was producing for it. The more important it was to the customer, the less stuff Liverpool content professionals were producing for it. And I find that pattern repeated in many, many organizations. Because often, this stuff, this long tail, is internal organizational ego. You know, whether it's senior management speeches or press releases, or the mayor just got up. 
He's now walking across the room. He might be approaching the water. Oh, let's release a press release. That's important news. Right. That's what the web team was doing in Liverpool before they did the top task analysis. The more important the stuff was to the customer, the less time was being focused on it. The less important to the customer, the more time that was being focused on it. They went from 4,000 pages to 700 pages. Right. They had a 400% increase in online reporting which was one of their key metrics of people reporting false rubbish collection, a 400% increase. Right? They had four complaints from the entire city of Liverpool, which I don't know, is about two million, two million people. Four complaints. But they had hundreds of complaints from staff. Where's my content gone? I know it's useless, but I still love it. Right? The tiny tasks, again, causing mayhem. Thank you.